Like was said, my name is Michael Scavarla. I am an assistant research professor at Penn State, and I run the Insect Identification Lab here. Uh, so I've got 100% extension appointment, working with the public day in and day out. Uh, and I do get a lot of requests for galls uh, that come into the lab, um, enough that I've written a couple fact sheets about them because people get these growths on their plants and they want to know if it's going to hurt the plant, if they need to cut it out, if they need to control it. Um, and so we're trying to get good information out there about them. So what exactly is a gall? A gall is any kind of abnormal plant growth that is induced by another organism that is not the plant. That's a pretty broad definition. Uh, galls can occur on any sort of plant tissue. So on the leaves, on the branches, on the stems, on the roots, uh, anywhere on the plant, if it's an abnormal growth caused by something else, it can be a gall. Uh, and because of this broad definition, galls can be induced by lots of different organisms, uh, things like viruses and bacteria. If you've ever been out in the woods and seen these big growths on trees, that's bacterial crown gall that's caused by a bacteria. If you were to cut that open, there's no insect in there. Um, it's just full of these bacteria that form these growths on trees and in a lot of other different plants. Galls can also be formed by fungi. Uh, so black knot is a common fungal gall on cherries here in the eastern U.S. If you go look at any black cherry, uh, you are more than likely to find black knot. It's really common. Galls can be formed by other plants. So mistletoe are parasitic plants that grow on other plants. And when they grow on other plants and push their roots into that host plant, uh, they can form galls around the mistletoe. Uh, nematodes are another uh, important former of galls. So here are examples of root knot nematode. This is an this is an important agricultural pest. Here on the left, you can see tomatoes that have normal roots. And here on the right are roots that have been affected by nematodes. And you can imagine like that can really impact things like nutrient and water uptake for these affected plants. And then finally, galls can, of course, be formed by mites and insects. And that's going to be the focus for the rest of the talk today. Um, but I did kind of want to get in like galls are formed by all kinds of other organisms as well. Now, galling has evolved within insects and mites at least 40 times, perhaps up to 100. It's a really commonly evolved life strategy. Uh, and it evolved in a whole bunch of different groups, things like flies and wasps, various true bugs, even moths and beetles, and things like gall forming mites. Now, looking at the mites, um, there's about 4,800 described species that induce galls at a, an, an estimated 50,000 worldwide. Um, so a lot of undescribed mite diversity that are gall formers. Uh, looking at insects, it's about 13,000 described insects that induce galls and about 120,000 that are estimated. Uh, again, about 10% of all insects are thought to be described. Um, and so that's part of the reason for this, this discrepancy. Um, there's about a million described species and about 10 million estimated total species that are out there. Uh, so if we just run the math, it doesn't matter if we look to described or estimated, somewhere around 1.2% of all insects induce galls. Um, and if we were to kind of run that out just for a safe estimate, somewhere 1% to 2% of all insects uh, make galls. So it's not a common life history strategy in insects, you know, 1%, but there's a lot of insects out there, so galls are fairly common. So why are galls induced? Why are these insects doing this? For the gall inducer, the insect that is making the galls happen, uh, it can create better habitat for growth and development. Um, you can imagine if an insect larva is inside this gall, it has protection from pathogens and predators and from the environment. It's not getting rained on, it's protected from the sun. They can also increase nutrition, so you're surrounded by your food source. Um, also, when galls are made, some of them can change plant physiology. So the gall has increased nutrition for that insect inside compared to other plant tissue. Uh, for the plant, uh, the benefits are less clear. Plants are harmed by galls because they are having, they're being eaten, they're having nutrients taken away from them, but it does restrain the gall inducer to a specific place. You can imagine a caterpillar that's just kind of on the outside of a leaf chewing away at a leaf and all of a sudden your leaf is gone, if you can constrain that caterpillar to a gall, yes, you're giving it more nutrients, but you're not losing leaf surface because it's just crawling all over 
eating your leaves willy-nilly. So what impact do galls have on the plants that they're on? Uh, impact really depends on the host and the location of those galls. So for example, uh, if a gall is on the leaf of a deciduous plant, if a, if a gall is on a tree leaf, they can cause aesthetic damage. Uh, a lot of people that have ornamental trees don't like to see galls on their leaves. They think they look ugly. Um, heavy infestations can reduce photosynthesis. So you can imagine this uh, heavily galled maple leaf on the bottom left. Lots of galls all over. Most of that leaf surface is taken up by galls. It can't really photosynthesize that well. And so the plant can't make as much energy. That does have some impact to plant health. But in general, having a couple galls on your leaves um, doesn't really impact long-term health of deciduous plants, of trees, of other, you know, tree uh, plants that lose their leaves in the fall. Um, that's good for homeowners. There's really no reason to control them. It's really difficult to control uh, tree leaf galls anyhow. Um, you can imagine part of the reason insects make galls is they're protected. You can't spray these things with a pesticide. It doesn't get into the galls. Um, and so what do you do if you've got galls in your leaves? Most of the time, just let them go. There's, there's not really an impact to the tree. Now, it's a different story when galls are formed on the stems of woody plants. So uh, galls formed on stems can weaken those stems and branches that can cause those stems and branches to break, such as, you know, during a heavy snow, during a windstorm. This creates a weak point in that branch and uh, can make it break. A few galls in a tree won't affect the long-term health of it. Um, you know, trees can grow, they can withstand a lot of damage. But if you've got like a really severe infestation, like this, this oak tree on the right that is heavily infested with uh, these oak stem galls, that could kill that tree. Heavy infestations of stem galls can really impact tree health. Uh, unfortunately, they're really difficult to control as well. Um, generally have to use like a systemic insecticide because again, you can't just spray this tree. The insecticides, if they're fully or topical, aren't going to get into those galls uh, to kill the insect. When galls are formed in the stems and growing points of herbaceous plants, things like goldenrods, uh, it can have some really weird effects, uh, different from when the galls are in trees. So, uh, Galled plants can have an increased number in the size or increased number in size of leaves. This can increase photosynthesis and water use. It can decrease things like plant height, plant size, the number of flowers and seeds that a plant puts out. But galls can also increase the number of flowers and seeds. So here, for example, is a rosette gall and a goldenrod. Goldenrods usually only put out kind of one flower stem, but because the apical meristem of this goldenrod has been galled and all messed up, it's put out three separate flower stalks, and so it's going to have increased flower and seed output compared to a non-galled plant. There are some root galls that get on trees. Uh, in general, again, if a tree is big and healthy and isn't stressed by other factors, if it's not, say, recently transplanted, uh, not suffering from drought stress, healthy trees can withstand root galls without any problem. They don't really impact the health of the tree. Um, there are root galls that get on other plants, herbaceous plants. I can't really find any information about them. Uh, nobody's really reviewed how they might impact plant health, um, at least as far as insects goes. Obviously, things like nem root knot nematodes can uh, severely impact uh, plant health like tomatoes, uh, but for insects, it's, it's not really too clear. Uh, so how are galls induced? How do these organisms make these plants do something that the plants don't normally do. Uh, there's a couple different ways. The first is when a mother insect uh, lays an egg into the plant tissue. She injects these gall forming factors with the egg and uh, that those factors that she injects cause these galls to grow. And we know that the mother's doing it and injecting these factors because if the larva dies inside that gall, the gall keeps growing. So uh, a good example of this are different kinds of saw flies, such as this willow apple gall. The other way that galls are induced are by the feeding by the galler. Um, so if the gall, if the gall forming insect dies, the gall stops growing because it's not being fed upon. Um, the gall feeding somehow stimulates the gall growth. 
Um, we think there might be factors in the saliva of the things that are feeding on the plant and making the galls grow. Um, part of the reason we think this uh, comes from this really neat experiment with spruce gall adelgid. So these are uh, plant feeding true bugs that get onto spruce. They form galls at the tip of the spruce. Um, and when the fundatrix, the uh, adelgid that hatches out first in the spring from an egg, uh, feeds on a spruce, uh, you can see her right here, this little fuzzy thing. Uh, she induces galls way out here at the tip of the spruce uh, branch, well away from where she's feeding. So and it, she's not physically reaching the area where the gall is being formed. So she's injecting something into the, the tree while she's feeding. Uh, and this is further backed up by the fact that gall formation success drops the further away the fundatrix is from the tip of the spruce. So the further away she is, the less success she has forming those galls. This is another really kind of neat system um, because the fundatrix, that female that hatches out in the spring, begins gall formation. Uh, she lays a bunch of eggs as the gall is growing. Those eggs hatch. Those babies all migrate to the gall, and then they continue to feed in the gall and finish gall formation. Um, so you've kind of got this two-step uh, feeding by different life uh, stages of, of these adelgids, and that's uh, neat and different. All of that said, gall formation is not well understood. Uh, we know that the gall inducers are hijacking the cellular machinery of these plants, forcing these plants to do things that they normally wouldn't do. They're redirecting plant genes in cell growth and cell division, uh, but we don't know how they're doing it. Uh, the best evidence suggests that somehow the insects, are, while they're feeding, are injecting some kind of chemical cue that are affecting plant hormones and affect things like auxin and cytokines, maybe some other compounds, but we don't really know what those chemicals that they're injecting are. Um, so it's really, it's this really weird situation where we know they're doing something. It's very obvious they're doing something. These galls are very different from plant tissue. We have really no idea what the specifics of uh, behind that gall induction are though. And it probably varies. Gall uh, induction has evolved up to 100 times and different insects are probably doing different things. Uh, gall formers are intimately tied to their host plants. If they're co-opting this cellular machinery to form galls, you can imagine that cellular machinery, those hormones in the plants are gonna be really different depending on how close related your plant hosts are. And so each gall inducing species is usually only attacking one or maybe a few closely related plant species. Gall morphology is unique to the species that induce them. Um, so this kind of hedgehog gall is unique to the wasp that is forming that gall. Um, all gall morphologies are unique to the species that are inducing them. It's an extended phenotype. So you can look at the gall and know what species that gall is being formed by without actually cutting the gall open and looking at the insect or the mite inside. This is really useful because you can identify galls or the gall inducers based on the shape of the galls and the host uh, of that the gall is on. So as far as plant hosts go, in North um, worldwide, there are a few plant groups that host the majority of gall diversity. In North America, uh, things like oaks and willows, uh, hickories and walnuts and other juglandaceae, goldenrods and relatives, so asteraceae, but solidago, the genus in particular, and rosaceae have most of our diversity. Other plants have galls, but this is where most of the gall diversity is in these few plant groups. So looking at hickories in particular, um, there are 44 species of phylloxerity, these little true bugs that form galls on hickories, the genus Caria. Um, they have all kinds of wild shapes to these leaf and stem galls that they form. The majority of phylloxera diversity is here in Eastern North America. Almost all of it is on hickories with a few on walnuts and things like butternuts. Um, there's also a bunch of gall mages and gall mites that get on hickories as well that has unexplored diversity. Um, but you have this whole diversity of this whole one insect group almost exclusively on one small group of trees. Uh, looking at oaks and roses, uh, these two groups are 
uh, galled primarily by gall wasps. So uh, we have about 750 species of gall wasps that are described from North America. 600 of those get on oaks and roses. So 80% of gall wasp diversity is on these two groups of plants. So most of the diversity of galling insects is on just these few groups of plants. Um, that said, some groups, plant groups are underserveyed. So herb gall wasps are a great example of this. There's only 40 described species here in North America, estimated up to 100 undescribed species. Um, so if we start looking at some of these different groups that are undersurveyed, we might really increase this diversity and add some other kind of plant groups to this list. If we look around the world, the plant groups that are preferred by galling insects really changes. So in Brazil, you've got Asterase E. So things like goldenrods and relatives. But you've got all these other tree families that we don't get here in North America because these are primarily tropical plant groups. In Australia, eucalyptus are really hit hard by galls. And again, eucalyptus are super diverse in Australia. We don't get them here natively, uh, but it makes sense that they would be a favored host for galls in that area. And then even weird groups that insects usually avoid, um, feeding-wise, herbivores uh, can also get galls. So things like ferns and other lycophytes, the um, liverworts, uh, mushrooms and algae and lichen, which aren't plants, um, but can still get galls on them. Uh, looking at the ferns and lycophytes in particular, there's only 93 species of gall-forming insects that get on them. Um, of the 13,000 gall-forming species, it's less than 1%, but ferns are a really weird host. Not a lot of insects feed on them at all. So it's neat that they get some gall uh, forming insects on them. Gall life cycles uh, can really vary depending on the host and the gall former. So a lot of gall formers have one generation per year, things like goldenrod gall flies. You can imagine goldenrods have an annual life cycle. The flies hatch out in the spring and lay their eggs on young goldenrods. As the flowers grow up, the galls expand. Uh, they overwinter as larvae in these galls and then hatch out the following spring. So because the goldenrods have this annual life cycle, the flies are just tracking that growth pattern. Things like mites, which have a faster generation time, can have multiple generations per year. Good example of this are spindle gall mites on maples. Um, so the spindle gall mites, their life cycle only takes about a week or two, and they continually grow and develop and reproduce as the maple leaves are expanding and growing. So any time from bud break to about mid-June when the leaves stop growing, they are having generations every couple of weeks. Uh, once the leaves stop growing, they stop reproducing because they can't form new galls after those leaves stop growing. Uh, but in that short time span, they're having multiple generations. And then things like stem galls can take multiple years per generation. So you can imagine the stem of a tree. It's fairly slow growing compared to something like a goldenrod or an annual plant because that part of the plant that they're forming a gall on is slower growing. The galls are slower growing and they might take two, three, even four years uh, from egg laying to develop uh, into a full adult insect. The life cycles can really vary between galling insects too from fairly simple to really complicated so again, goldenrod gall flies, fairly simple life cycle. The adults hatch out in the spring, lay eggs. The galls form all summer. The larvae feed in that gall all summer. They overwinter, and then they hatch out again in the spring. Fairly simple. They have a single host, uh, and that's it. Compared to something like oak gall wasps, uh, these wasps have alternative sexual and parthenogenic life uh, or generations. So parthenogenesis is just when a, an organism, an insect, can lay eggs without mating. So you have a female, she doesn't mate, and she can just lay eggs, and all of those eggs are clones of herself. So they have these alternating generations between sexual generations, where you've got males and females that mate and lay eggs, parthenogenic generations. Those different generations are forming different kinds of galls on different parts of the plant. So one of them is forming these fuzzy galls on oak leaves. Another the other generation is forming these kind of bud galls on oak buds during the winter. Uh, to complicate matters more, um, the different generations, these are both females of the asexual and sexual generations, so they look different, they're color different, they have different morphologies. Um, and because this these life cycles are so complicated, you can imagine if you catch these different wasps at different times of year and don't know that they're forming galls 
and are related, um, you could describe these as different species. And that has happened multiple times. Also, it's happened a lot of times where you catch just one of the generations and describe that as a species, but don't have kind of the alternate generation. And so half of the life cycle remains undescribed. Another fairly complicated life cycle happens in great phylloxera. So uh, great phylloxera are true bugs. They form these galls on grape leaves. Um, parthenogenically, the females lay eggs that are all clones of herself. They colonize the grape leaves, form these galls. About midway through the summer, they the immatures migrate down into the dirt and start feeding on the roots. They don't form galls on the roots. Um, again, they're parthenogenic. They're laying eggs that are clones of themselves. They grow up into the fall, make sexual forms that mate, lay eggs that overwinter and start the cycle again. So you have this galling generation followed by a non-galling generation feeding on different parts of the same host plant. Woolly aphids take that even further. So you've got gall formers that form galls primarily on tree leaves. So things like elm sac gall aphids making these uh, sac galls on elm leaves. They come out in the spring when the leaves are small and growing and they can really get these galls to grow on the growing leaves. And then about midway through the summer, they host switch onto grass roots. When they host switch, they look totally different from the gall forming generation. They don't form galls on those grass roots. They're often associated with ants. Um, so you've got these really different life stages in morphologies based on what they're doing. Sometimes they're galling, sometimes they're not. They're on different host plants. Um, so it can get really complicated really quickly. Galls are kind of an ecosystem in and of themselves. They can be thought of as ecosystem engineers. So to take just one example, we look at white oaks. Uh, they get a this little fuzzy leaf gall that's formed by Philonix fulvicornis. doesn't have a common name. Um, these are the galls. This is the gall former, the little wasp that makes them. These, the larvae inside these galls are parasitized by a whole host of other different tiny wasps. So these wasps come in, lay their eggs through the gall, parasitize the gall forming wasp and eat the larva. They also host inquilines, other wasp species that can't initiate gall formation themselves, but they'll come along, usurp the gall, feed on the gall tissue, often feed on the, the galling larva itself and kill it, um, and use that gall as their own, even though they can't induce galls themselves. So you've got this whole kind of ecosystem in miniature, because these are all very tiny wasps, based entirely on this one species of gall, and you can imagine this happens with every gall out there. Each species of gall often hosts various parasites and inquilines. Depending on how well known the system is, often the inquilines and parasitoids aren't known. You might know what the gall inducer is, but maybe know some of the parasites but in, in inquilines, but not all of them. If the gall former is unknown, you likely won't know what any of these species are. So oftentimes these gall ecosystems are a black box because we just don't have enough people kind of uh, researching it, looking into just what is all associated with these galls. It's not just insects though that rely on galls um, as, as part of the ecosystem. So going back to these goldenrod gall flies, I mentioned that they overwinter as larvae in the gall. Lots of birds love to feed on them. You can imagine this is kind of like a nut. You've got a hard outer center uh, in a juicy, protein, nutrient-filled, soft inner bit, kind of like the, the inside of the nut, the heart of the nut. And so things like chickadees and downy woodpeckers will find these galls, tear them apart, and get the larvae inside. Uh, and just to kind of show that this is a fairly common occurrence, here's a bunch of photos of chickadees and uh, downy woodpeckers going after a whole bunch of different kind of galls. It's not just goldenrod galls. Um, you know, they're going after these oak galls on oak twigs, uh, rose galls, all kinds of galls. If it's a gall, they'll find it, tear it apart, get the larvae inside. It's so just as birds. Squirrels treat galls just like nuts as well. They will find galls, tear them apart, and get that juicy larva on the inside. You know, especially in the winter, this is a really good source of, um, of energy, uh, very similar to a nut. Humans have also used galls uh, throughout history. So oak galls in particular are high in tannins. Uh, tan has historically have been really useful in the tanning industry. If you want to take a piece of animal skin and turn it into leather, um, 
you will often add tannins to it. And how did people get tannins historically? One of the ways is harvesting oak galls and extracting tannins from them. Um, they have high tannins because, again, they're changing uh, the tree and leaf physiology. If you can add a lot of tannins to the outside of your gall, that might uh, prevent things like squirrels uh, from eating that gall because tannins are extremely distasteful. Tannins are what give uh, dry wine that dry taste. So you can imagine if these things are packed in tannins and a squirrel bites into it, that's not going to taste very good. Another place that humans have used, uh, particularly oak galls, is in iron gall ink. Um, so when you mix iron in the tannin that you extract from these galls, you get ferrous tannate. This is water soluble. It can penetrate paper, which is good. That's what you want ink to do. When it dries, it turns into ferric tannate, which is water insoluble. So after it dries, you can't get this ink back out of the paper and it dries darker than when you apply it. So that's really good. That is exactly what you kind of want in an ink. Um, it does have downsides. So the tannins um, lead to ink corrosion. So it can break down cellulose. Here's a historic document that used iron gall ink and you can see where the ink was, the paper is kind of rotted away. That's not great. Um, but because it is so easy to make uh, and oak galls are extremely widespread, so is iron. Uh, iron gall ink was the most common ink in Europe from the 400s to the 1800s. Uh, and a lot of important documents were written and signed in oak gall ink, things like the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Um, part of the reason they have this kind of lightish brown color to the ink is this is iron gall ink, and that's just what it looks like. Some other places that galls have been used by people historically is in medicine. So uh, during excavations of Pompeii, um, which was covered by a volcano, what, 2,000 years ago, um, one of the things that they found is this collection of almost three and a half kilograms of over 2,000 oak galls in a basket. And the authors of the, the paper that described it hypothesized that these galls were sold to Romans uh, for medicine. There's also descriptions, uh, again, from Roman literature, from Pliny, um, that oak galls were used as dye. So particularly the galls and the tannins in them were extracted and used to blacken the hair and to dye wool a darker color. So that's kind of an overview of galls in general. Um, I mentioned there's lots of different insects and mites that can form galls. I thought I would go through some of them just to give you a flavor of what these different gall forming arthropods are, what they're doing, the kinds of galls that they're making, the kind of plants they're getting onto. So aryphyid mites are the, the main mites that form galls. There's about 5,000 described species, about 50,000 estimated. These things are tiny, uh, 0.2 millimeters, um, if you're more into inches, they're seven one thousandths of an inch long. Um, you can hardly make them out with the naked eye, but the galls are, that they make are fairly obvious. There are free living in gall forming species. I can't find a breakdown of how many form galls versus how many are free living, but they are called the gall forming mites. So I think it's probably a majority. Because they're so tiny, you can get millions to billions of individual mites on a single host plant, especially if you have something big like a tree. Uh, and many of these species are important agricultural pests. Some are biocontrol agents, some are both. Um, so this is some tree of heaven that we were growing in a greenhouse. Usually in outdoor spaces, it's a pest invasive tree species. We are growing it for some spotted lanternfly experiments. So in this case, we wanted to grow it. We got this uh, aryphyid, Outbreak, and you can see here's a healthy tree, here's a heavily infested tree. They can really, like heavy aryphyid mite uh, infestations can really affect tree and plant health. The galls that are formed by the gall forming species are fairly simple. They're these sac and spindle galls. Um, they're just kind of these hollow extensions of the leaf. If you flip the leaf over, you'll find there's a little hole on the bottom side of these galls where the, the mites can crawl out and crawl over the, the rest of the leaf. Another type of gall that the aryphyid mites in particular can form are these Araneum galls. So it's a little bit difficult to kind of see in these pictures, but you can imagine if you were to put your finger on these galls, they feel really fuzzy, like a wool on top of a leaf. Um, and oftentimes they don't really affect plant health. They're not often very widespread. 
Sometimes they can get fairly widespread on a couple of leaves, but you can imagine if this is your maple tree and you don't like these galls on them, you can cut out this individual branch and dispose of it and they don't otherwise affect your, your tree's health. Thrips are another uh, group that forms galls. There's about 5,000 described species of thrips worldwide. Again, there's no good kind of data on how many of them induce galls. It's not super common, but it does happen. Um, gall inducing species are found in all biogeog biogeographic regions, including here in North America. Um, most gall forming species are subtropical. So here in the United States, we get them mostly in Florida and California. Uh, two economically important species are the Cuban laurel thrips and the weeping fig thrips. You can see they form these kind of curled leaf galls. You open one of these curls up and it is packed with these thrips that are feeding on the inside. Uh, gall inducing uh, thrips are especially diverse in tropical Asia and Australia. Some really neat ones, in particular, this group Cladothrips. So this is the one of the few groups of eusocial insects. So eusocial things are things like ants, social bees and wasps, um, termites, the groups of insects that have one reproductive in a colony and then a bunch of sterile workers. Uh, this group of thrips also have eusocial eusociality, so one reproductive and a lot of sterile individuals in there. They also have this cool soldier cast where the front legs of these thrips are big and beefy and have these big spines on them. And so if an invader comes into this gall, they defend it by stabbing the invader with these big old spines. And if you crack one of these galls open, there's hardly any good photos of them anywhere online, but you can see that they are just packed uh, to the brim with different thrips. Thrips form mostly leaf, flower, and fruit galls. Um, again, lots of these in tropical Asia and Australia. You can have up to 100,000 individual thrips per gall. Um, so galls sometimes contain multiple species, which is kind of neat as well. Another group that form galls are different beetles. So there's almost 400,000 described beetle species. Very few of them form galls. So this isn't a very I'm going to say popular, uh, very common life uh, style in beetles. Um, very few um, gall forming species, and it, they only occur in two families, the weevils, which includes most of them, and the, the chrysomelids, the, the leaf beetles. Most galls that beetles form are on branches and roots. Uh, there's a few that can get on leaves and fruits, um, not really here in North America. Ours are mostly branch uh, in, in root gallers. And beetles, for the most part, make these simple swellings. They're, um, you can see this uh, pine gall weevil here. It looks mostly like a normal branch with a big spot in it. You can see the exit um, hole here where the, be the weevil dug out. Um, but there's not really, it's not like some of these other galls where, you know, it's big and showy, maybe fruit-like on a leaf. It just kind of makes the stem get thicker. Um, and if you crack that open, there's no differentiation of the nutritive tissue. There's no kind of change in the physiology um, on the inside of this. It's just making more kind of tissue around this swelling. So they're not really affecting uh, the plants that much the way some of these other gall farming insects do. A few species are used um, as biocontrol or, or are pests. Uh, so for example, pine gall weevil, this is a pest species here in Eastern North America, it gets on different pine species. They're never really that numerous. So you can just kind of, if you find these, you can just trim them out and dispose of them and that should control them well enough. Um, they're never so numerous that they kill trees, but they might be aesthetically unappealing, uh, but they're fairly easy to control. Uh, a species that's used for biocontrol is Rhinusa pilosa. It's not, doesn't have a common name, um, but it's native to Europe and was released in the Western United States to control yellow toad flax, which is an invasive plant over there that gets, um, if I recall correctly, it gets into like um, cattle lots. Um, and you can see here these big old galls that they induce on the toad flax that reduces plant fitness. Uh, moths are a group that people don't generally associate with galls. Um, and for good reason, there's only 180 species of moths that form galls worldwide out of about 150,000 described species. So about 0.1% of all moths form galls. It's not, again, a common life cycle or lifestyle. 
but it has independently evolved in up to 20 families. So while it's not super common, it has come about multiple times. Uh, most of the diversity is in two families, the Gelakeids, the leaf twirlers, and the tortricids, um, blanking on the common name. Uh, and, but these two groups account for almost half of all gull forming moths. Similar, or uh, most galls are induced by the larvae, so through feeding. Uh, and similar to the beetles, most moth galls are just simple swellings, um, often on stems. You can see this uh, goldenrod gall here. It just makes the stem a little bit bigger, and the moth feeds on the inside. Some are more elaborate, uh, but in general, they're fairly simple galls. Uh, just to give you some idea of the kind of moth galls that we have here in eastern North America, um, we have two species that get on goldenrods and kind of make these, these slight, thin stem swellings, um, very different from the tephritid flies. Uh, we also have a species that gets on grape leaves and forms these kind of little blister galls, and another species that gets on the petioles of Virginia creeper leaves. There are no photos of the galls anywhere. I can't find them. Um, but they do hit Virginia creeper. Uh, another group that gets that forms galls are the true bugs. There's a bunch of different families that have gall-inducing species. Psyllidae, um, this is a group that's most diverse in the tropics. I bring it up here, though, because we have boxwood psyllids commonly uh, anywhere you have boxwoods planted as ornamental plants. Um, boxwood psyllid feeding forms these kind of cupped leaves on the terminal end of boxwood twigs. Uh, depending on what source you go to, some people will just call these cup leaves. Other people will describe these as leaf galls. Depending on how you define what a gall is, maybe they're galls, maybe they're not galls, but we have this species. It is maybe a gall former. Uh, super common though. If you go out and look at boxwoods, you're almost certain to find these just about everywhere. Another group that form galls are scale insects. We have lots of scale insects here in North America. Um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Worldwide, 230 species of scale insects are known to form galls. I can't find any of them that are here in North America, but they seem to be really common in Australia. So this, all of these photos are from Australian uh, scale, gall, gall forming scales. Um, so it's kind of neat. Seems like Australia has some really weird stuff going on, um, including these gall forming scales. Uh, a group that we do have here in North America are various gall forming aphids. So you're probably familiar with aphids. They are plant feeding pests. Um, they get different species are often pests in things like gardens. Sometimes they'll feed on different species on trees. Some species form galls. Uh, in particular, the woolly aphids and the gall forming aphids, this subfamily Areosomata tiny. Uh, they almost exclusively form galls on tree leaves. Many species, interestingly, form galls on elms in particular. Um, I didn't really think it through. This is a sumac gall former, um, so not an elm, but a majority of these species are hitting elms. Uh, and it's kind of neat because they also host alternate. So they start off on elms, form these galls, and then switch to grass roots uh, later in the season. Uh, again, this is similar to the phylloxerids I mentioned. The galls are only in, uh, induced by the fundatrix. This female that hatches out from an egg early in the spring, she forms the gall, crawls inside, and then lays a bunch of eggs via parthenogenesis. Those all hatch out in the clones of herself. Uh, and you can get up to 1,700 individual aphids per gall, all descended from this single female that induced the gall. Aphid galls are often kind of simple sacs or leaf curls. You can see that here. And the sumac gall that's been cut open, um, it's just kind of a big hollow ball. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on in there. And just to give kind of a flavor of some of the aphid galls that we get here, these are all elm galls um, formed by species that are native to eastern North America. So um, elm coxcone gall here on the left is probably about the most interesting, complex gall you get. It forms this kind of multi-ridged gall. Um, it kind of looks like a chicken comb, uh, hence a coxcomb. The other ones are these kind of simple sacks that form on leaves, and then some roll the leaves into these leaf roll galls. And then flies are uh, 
one of the two kind of biggest, most diverse groups of gall forming insects. Uh, some families have evolved gall inducing species. Most of that diversity is only in two families, particularly Cicidomyidae, the appropriately named gall midges. Um, there's about 6,300 described species of gall midges worldwide. It's estimated there's between 100,000 and 1.8 million species just of this family. Um, so if you recall from the beginning of the talk, there's 1.2 million species of insects described. There may be more gall midges out there than all described insects, period. Um, it is a really undersurveyed group that we know very little about that has possibly an insane amount of diversity that is just unlooked at. Uh, most species induce galls, hence the name gall midges. Uh, some species are free living, they're predators, parasites on other groups. Some are inquilines on galls formed by other species, so that kind of like some of these wasps, the inquilines can't form their own galls, but they will go in and usurp a gall that is formed by a different species and then feed on it. Um, and it's neat, the gall, the non-gall forming species are unrelated to each other, so it seems like galling has evolved and unevolved multiple times in this group. Um, being a really diverse group of insects and both species, um, in terms of species, both described and undescribed, um, galls are formed on all of the different plant parts. Um, not as commonly on roots as other parts of the plants, but gall midges will form galls on lots of plants all over the plant. Uh, most species are host specific. There are a few species that seem to have wide host ranges, but again, there's a lot of undescribed diversity here. So these wide host ranges might just be multiple species that are described as a single species right now. Uh, galls formed by gall midges are often really complex. They're some of the most complex galls that you can get um, produced by insects. Again, here's another plate of Australian and Papa New Guinea galls. Um, I picked it because it's got a really nice display of different diversity. Um, you can get, you know, big red things, little fuzzy things, little pimply galls, big spiky galls. Um, lots of little galls on a single leaf. A lot of diversity. We have similar diversity to this here in North America. Um, this is just a convenient kind of plate to show. Uh, but lots of diversity in terms of gall morphology, the plants that they're getting on, um, the parts of the plants that they're hitting. And some gall midges are really important pests. So the most important is probably hessian fly. Uh, this is one of the oldest invasive species in North America. It was first discovered in 1779. It's an important, it's one of the most important pests of wheat. So the flies lay eggs um, and they form these little uh, kind of discrete galls at the base of the wheat, uh, but those galls weaken the wheat to the point where they fall over and die. So here on the bottom right, you can see what kind of impact that has. All of the green here are resistant wheat cultivars that have been bred to be resistant to hessian fly. All of the brown patches are non-resistant cultivars, so you get can get up to 100% mortality in wheat of non-resistant varieties. Again, it's a galling insect, but it can be a really important pest. Others are biocontrol agents. So Melaleuca gall midge um, is an example of this. Melaleuca is a tree species that's native to Australia, planted in Florida where it's kind of escaped and become an invasive species. So we went to Australia, found this gall midge, and found that it can kill small saplings in trees uh, and released it here as a biocontrol agent of this invasive tree. Tephridity um, is a, the other kind of important family of flies. 4,300 described species, about 5% of them induce galls, and almost all of those colonize Asteraceae, things like goldenrods. And again, this is goldenrod gallfly. This is our native species. But almost all of the diversity of these gall forming tephridids are getting on Asteraceae and, and often goldenrod in particular. And then the last kind of important group of gall forming insects are the gall wasps. Uh, this is the group Cynopoidea, recently broken into a couple different families. Historically, they've all been called Cynipidae, the oak and herb gall wasps. It's about 1,400 described species worldwide, about a thousand of those are in North America. So of this really important gall-forming insect group, 
we actually have most of the diversity here instead of like in the tropics and the jungle. Um, most of these things are here in North America, so that's kind of neat. And these form the most complex galls of any of the insects that we've talked about. Um, these are things like the oak apple galls where you got uh, this big swelling and you cut it open and there's all these little threads that go to you know this little bean where the uh, larval wasp is feeding on the inside this kind of hard gall here that has all these different chambers on the inside that the larvae are feeding on. Uh, again, super complex galls. They often have these complex life cycles. I mentioned this one earlier with the alternating sexual and asexual generations and different morphologies. Um, these are the, the galling insects that form those really complex ecological food webs with parasitoids um, and other insects coming into the galls. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned this earlier. Uh, and again, lots of undescribed species or species that have been described multiple times because we're describing these different generations as different species. Um, so gall wasps are kind of where it's at in terms of interesting galls and diversity uh, when you're talking about gall forming insects. So kind of just to bring this all together, um, to use one group of trees as an example of all of the diversity that you can get of gall forming insects. We're going to look at galls of maples. So if you go to your maple tree in your backyard, you could find maple bladder galls, uh, these little kind of bladdery galls that form on maple leaves. These are formed by mites. Other mites include maple spindle galls, these really tall galls that often form on sugar maples. Uh, Araneum galls, these are formed on a whole different a bunch of different kinds of maple species. Box elder pouch gall, this is a box elder specialist, um, but again, it's a mite that gets on maples. Um, I guess box elders are maples. If you start looking at the flies, you get things like eye spot gall midge that form these really neat um, kind of bullseye looking uh, galls on maple leaves. Uh, leaf, various leaf vein galls formed by gall forming midges. Um, so they'll get in and make this vein get really big. Uh, leaf vein bead galls. This is actually an undescribed species from here in the Northeast. Um, it's some kind of gall midge, but it's undescribed. It doesn't have a name, even though we these galls are very distinctive and all over the place. Box elder bud gall. This is a, a gall midge that gets onto the buds of box elder and forms these really big kind of petiole swellings on the leaf or swellings on the base of the leaf. And then in Europe, we don't have these here, but they have maple gall wasps. So um, these big kind of, they look like oak galls that we get here, but they're on maples over there. Galls are really diverse. The insects that form them are really diverse. There is a lot going on with them. Um, honestly, you could teach an entire like college course just around galls. There's so much there. 